everyone. I'm Joan Kerr, and this is World Canvas from International Programs at the University of Iowa. We're glad to have you with us as we explore the arts in India and South Asia. We're coming to you from the beautiful Senate Chamber of the Old Capitol Museum on the campus of the University of Iowa, and I'd like to begin by thanking our partners, UITV, the University of Iowa Pentecrest Museums, KRUI-FM, and Information Technology Services. This program is being recorded for statewide television and radio distribution over UITV, Iowa Public Radio, and KRUI-FM. It will also be available along with all programs in this series as a free podcast on iTunes. Our first guests this evening are Paul Greeno, Professor of History as well as Community and Behavioral Health at the University of Iowa. He's also co-director of the South Asian Studies Program and director of the Crossing Borders Program. Thanks, Paul, for being here. My pleasure. <laughs> and Philip Letkendorf, Professor of Hindi and Modern Indian Studies in the University of Iowa's Department of Asian and Slavic Languages and Literatures. Philip also serves as president of the American Institute of Indian Studies. Hey, Philip. Hi, Joan. Thank you. Yes, and uh, we're also joined by Frederick Smith. And uh, uh, Fred, you can give us a little bit about um, you know, what you do here at the university. Perhaps you can fill us in. But certainly, I know you teach Hindi, and you work with the South Asian Studies Program. And uh, it, tell us what you do. Well, I'm, I'm a professor of Sanskrit and uh, Sanskrit, classical I'm Indian sorry. religions, and jointly appointed in the Religious Studies Department and the um, um, Asian and Slavic Languages of Literature uh, Department, and uh, also with Paul, co-director of the uh, South Asian Studies Program at the moment. Right. Well, <coughs> thanks. I'm glad you could be with us. I know you've broken your foot, and it's not so easy to do such things, so thanks. Uh, Paul, I want to turn to you first and talk to you a little bit about this conference that this particular program is, is actually sort of in the middle of. This is a conference on um, new culture, new welfare in India and South Asia, and um, I know that you've brought many of your students and colleagues here to discuss this, this um, uh, topic and particularly focusing on the arts in India. You're right. Uh, the focus is on the arts of uh, India. It's a, it's a course and a conference at the same time. We have a number of really distinguished um, specialists from other parts of the country who have come to us, as well as members of our own faculty here. Uh, <clears throat> this, uh, the idea for this is linked to the 150th anniversary of the birth of Rabindranath Tagore, one of the most famous poets and artists in the world. Uh, he was born 150 years ago, and he won the Nobel Prize in 1913 for literature. And you'd like to know this, Joan, in October of 1916, he came to the University of Iowa and gave a lecture that the whole university attended and was kind of a sensation. Really? Yeah, yeah. So we're marking that moment, but also it's an occasion within the university to gather together and take stock of what the University of Iowa does in the area of, uh, of the arts. Uh, this is an area which has been a little um, under-resourced in the past by, by the administration, and we're trying to uh, raise its uh, visibility. Mm -hmm. Well, as, as those of you who've helped to prepare this program know, we're going to be talking about various arts uh, in Indian traditions and um, longstanding cultural uh, crafts and so on. Uh, but you had a, one section in your, your uh, discussion, I think, earlier today that I was intrigued by giving artistic genius and cultural tradition their due. That's one of the, one of the things you're trying to do with this conference and public series of events. Well, we posed ourselves some questions uh, of a more theoretical nature about uh, why people do arts, especially in, in India, uh, which uh, it's a country if you travel and uh, you're uh, struck by an immense investment in a country that is basically poor, uh, immense investment in uh, forms of uh, design and architecture and ritual and music. And in the spoken word, the whole uh, surface appearance of India, you don't have to be an expert to see that mm -hmm. this is a place where uh, artistic expression, uh, whether as craft or as even as studio art, and now extending into graphic arts and mm -hmm. cinema, uh, is taken very, very seriously. So the question really does arise in a developing country with so many other challenges, why is so much effort continuously invested in these uh, symbolic and uh, attractive uh, forms uh, outside us. So we're, we're, we're certainly looking at that, uh, at that question. 
In addition, some of the colleagues who are here have very particular and focused interest on particular groups of painters or um, uh, household uh, decorative customs, uh, which, uh, which women transmit from mother to daughter, uh, which uh, beautify and um, give, give, a, give a particular kind of aesthetic focus to, uh, to household life. So uh, and that's what we're doing. We're, we're tapping people's specialty interests in an effort to get an overall view of where art comes from and why it's produced. And I know one of the other questions, too, is who's buying this art? Uh, um, Philip, you spent the last year in India and many, many um, long periods of time in past years. Um, what can you add to what Paul has just said about what you're investigating in this conference? Well, I, um, I gave a little talk yesterday um, focusing on a festival that I witnessed <coughs> excuse me, in Bengal exactly a year ago. In fact, yesterday uh, was the anniversary of the climax of it, so it was climaxing once again. Um, which uh, involves the production of um, uh, outdoor dioramas on a religious theme. And these are produced on a massive scale uh, in, in Calcutta and in other parts of uh, the Bengali culture area. And um, it was, a, for me, I'm, I'm not an art specialist or an art historian, and I was in India doing other kinds of research, but this was a very, very striking cultural phenomenon that I found myself in the middle of and was fascinated by. So I, I made some remarks about that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, Fred, I know that you also spent a lot of time in India and were there, I think, up until midsummer or so. And uh, when, when you're there uh, visiting these local communities and really becoming a part of, of daily life, what in the way of the art stands out as, as an immediate uh, uh, recognizable fact about India? Well, India is an amazingly uh, brightly colored country, I, there's, if there's anything that stands out to a casual visitor, not to speak of somebody who's been there for years and years like the three of us, that, uh, that the whole country is really marked out by all of these both local and now um, globalized uh, artistic forms that are just everywhere. I mean, it's just uh, on every street corner and every, almost every square inch of a, of a person's house. But, as we're discussing in the uh, symposium now, what really does it mean to be an artist? What really does art mean? Uh, do the same definitions of art that, that we have in the West, particularly as, as you know, higher level art, uh, how can these be generalized in, um, in India? Uh, do, do artists there really see themselves the same way that artists see themselves here? Uh, all these questions we're discussing, it in this way it's, it's the, Symposium is becoming very, very interesting because we're getting into these deeper levels of, of what does art mean, what, do, what does it mean to be an artist, uh, how, do, how do artistic forms uh, modernize and change and become transnational. It's, it's a whole big gamut of, of questions that's being opened up by this seminar. Mm -hmm. And I suspect <clears throat> you're discussing the uh, economics behind the art too. Who is making money of the of the uh, art that is produced? And you know, here in the West, um, sometimes there's a distinction made between craft and art. Some sort of distinction between sort of everyday craftsmanship, however fine it is, and some kind of high art. Is is that a distinction that is made as, as you look at art in South Asia? Yeah, of course there's, there's that distinction, but it's interesting that you ask who's making money as opposed to what is the cost of producing art. Mm -hmm. Uh, the idea that there's an intermediary between the craftsman or the artist and the consumer or the connoisseur, which in the West would be uh, a gallery owner, um, um, other kinds of people who are um, adding to the price and giving something off, that isn't necessarily the case in South Asia where you have a lot of people whose primary economic activity is to make objects that we call fine, fine craft or art and sell it directly to the consumer. Um, often these are objects which are, uh, they have a short lifespan, so they're continuously renewed, uh, things made of textiles and potteries and so on, um, textiles and pottery, and uh, these uh, uh, craft-making traditions are uh, the traditional familial or caste-based uh, occupation of millions of people. Uh, the largest uh, artisanal group 
in India are weavers, and as far back as anyone knows, weavers have been maybe five to 10% of the entire population of India. Cloth wears out, but the cloth that people wear is always decorated. It always has some element of design attached to it. The idea of wearing completely plain cloth, even for poor people, would be unfamiliar. So there's nobody making money in the sense of uh, coming between the producer and the consumer. Uh, it isn't that it, I think nowadays, there is, a, there is a gallery culture in India. It's exploding. I mean, if you look at uh, studio painting, for example, uh, canvases painted by living Indian artists are fetching seven figures at Sotheby's and Christie's and so on. So there's a high end, and there's a peasant cultivator, uh, and, and art is produced for all of them continuously. Yeah. Yeah. We've been talking about everything from what you might call subsistence art, um, made by communities that are traditional hereditary producers of certain kinds of, um, for example, we had a presentation today on scroll painting, scroll painters from Bengal, so a, a traditional storytelling community that produced uh, illustrated scrolls to go along with their stories. Um, but now people are not so interested in the scrolls and the stories because they have other kinds of entertainment media, television and, and film and so forth, and so these painters are finding new ways to uh, make a living, and they and which they have to do. I mean, it's their it's their livelihood. But we also have presentations on the sort of high end of the art market, the uh, urban artists who produce for galleries and museums, and and have in some cases international uh, reputations and followings. We've also been looking at um, internet uh, art, virtual art and sites, mm -hmm. sites where art and religion come together um, in uh, uh, websites where you can go and, and do certain religious practices within the Hindu tradition. Right, right. Well, I, I'd like to have us discuss for a minute or two some of the opportunities students have here at the University of, of Iowa to study about South Asia. And, and in this case, we're talking specifically about the arts. But in terms of the offerings here at the university and your own specialties, uh, what do we have to offer at the University of Iowa? Well, we have, we have quite a bit to offer uh, mm -hmm. for those out there who are yeah. <laughs> looking for a uh, specialism as students in the university. Uh, well, first, we have a South Asian Studies program, which is not a degree program, it's not a certificate program, it's an interdisciplinary um, set of activities, um, but it organizes uh, visitors to campus. It helps organize a study abroad program in India, which for 15 years in the very beautiful royal southern city of Mysore, our students go there for the fall semester. In fact, we have uh, a dozen or so students there right now. Yeah. Uh, so that's a special opportunity, uh, and all, they take courses, which mm -hmm. of course uh, accrue to their, their majors, and, right. and they graduate on time. We also have, I mean, uh, Philip and Fred teach Indian languages from beginning elementary to very uh, high level, yeah. uh, uh, very high level, I'll just yeah. leave it at that. Yeah. I teach history, we have two anthropologists, we have people in uh, journalism and geography mm -hmm. and another, a number of other departments. So. Uh, while we're not a major center for South Asian or India studies, we're a very solid uh, program, and some of our students uh, go on to the very best uh, PhD granting institutions in the world uh, as specialists, and I keep meeting them. <laughs> I, last summer I went to Austin uh, for a conference, and there was a student who was a second year undergraduate in a class of mine 20 years ago, oh. and she's a professor of Tamil literary yeah. studies at the uh, University of Texas. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and I know that for the last few years, there's this been, been this very popular Winterim course uh, that has many, many sections going to India for the three weeks between uh, the end of the fall semester and the beginning of the spring semester. I believe that perhaps all of you have been part of that, but certainly I think Fred uh, has. And uh, have you also been there during the Winterim period, Philip? Uh, with the Winterim? Not with directly. The winterim program? Not directly. No, no, but I know that that's also allowed students who are interested in many different things in India, whether it's global health or uh, mm -hmm. uh, art. I see Anita here, and uh, she taught a, a section in art. So there are lots of opportunities for students mm -hmm. on this campus to get abroad and then to study here. Um, this 
very important region and area. We're going to be talking in just a moment um, about two very important figures in Indian history, uh, Gandhi and Tagore, and we'll be inviting a couple of people up to, to really uh, get deeply into that topic. But as we begin to discuss India and Indian art here, what should we know about um, either ancient or recent Indian history to sort of help set the stage for this discussion? Well, I mean, in five minutes that's, or less, that's, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's an amazingly broad uh, question. It's hard. Yeah, well, yeah. I, each of us probably would pick out something, but I'll just point to something which is very current. There is a movement. You know that India has been for 65 years a constitutional democracy with a very regular series of democratic elections. It has a, a highly uh, a sophisticated legal system. It has Supreme Court review. It has civil liberties. It's a very stable country in many ways. But at the moment, India is in a state of turmoil over a proposal uh, coming from a man named Anna Hazare. He's leading a group. It's a kind of insurgent group uh, in, this, in the streets. It's very peaceful. It uses Gandhian methods, but they are preoccupied with the issue of corruption in public office, in the, in the police, in the courts, in the government ministries, and so on. And uh, Anna Hazare has galvanized uh, a segment of the public, at least, in, mostly in the cities. It's pretty much a middle class effort. Uh, to uh, create a new office in parallel with the existing um, governing system of, of something called a Lokpal, we would call an ombudsman, but with very strong powers to interrogate the question of corruption in an effort to get a hold of something, the problem of corruption, which is very serious in India. Mm -hmm. And uh, this uh, Anna Hazare has stymied the government, who's been tried to sidetrack him, I think it's fair to say, mm -hmm. by threatening to starve himself to death in the, in the tradition of Gandhi, to fast to death. And this has governments trembling in their boots. Mm -hmm. And they keep backing up and making accommodations. And now it looks like there may really be a mm -hmm. consequence. This is people power. Mm -hmm. We've mm -hmm. all been reading about the Arab Spring, but yeah. actually there's an Indian Spring, there's yeah. something very interesting and new mm -hmm. taking place. It mm -hmm. sounds like a really good idea, Paul. Do you think, you think we could do it here? <laughs> I think they started it last week on Wall Street. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. Occupy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I'll, I'll ask uh, both of, of you, too, Fred and uh, yeah, Philip. Yeah, let, let, let me say a word about that, because I actually participated in one of these demonstrations this summer the, in, in Mysore, this Anahazade-led uh, um, anti-corruption movement. Um, and as far as the relevance to what we're actually doing here at this program is that, you know, I had, I had read, of course, all of us have read widely about the um, events leading up to independence in 1947 in India and the kinds of, of public um, protests or events that, of that independence struggle. But it was the first time in all my many, many years of going to India that I actually participated in such a program. And as far as the relevance to art is concerned, there was a lot of, of so, there was somebody who had composed these kind of anti-corruption songs that were linking the anti-corruption movement with the Indian freedom movement, and there was artwork that was springing up around this thing. And I wouldn't be surprised if, maybe even by now, a few months later, that there's artwork about this Anahazade and, and others. So I think that, that wherever there's a civil movements going on, there's going to be a kind of a connection with, with music, with art, and it's, you know, and this is going to rise, I think, with, with, with prominence of this thing, assuming it goes any further than it is now. But uh, yeah, there's these strong connections with uh, civil society, with arts, with music, and it's, it's very prominent. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Philip, any thoughts? Um, well, I guess I would uh, step back a little bit and take um, a little bit longer view and say um, that particularly since independence, since 1947, there has been a kind of uh, gradual and mostly quiet revolution going on in India, a social revolution that um, I think a lot of people in the West are not aware of. And um, there are you know, extremely serious issues of corruption and social uh, injustice there, but there has also been a really tremendous affirmative action program um, tremendous efforts made to bring formerly disenfranchised groups into um, 
their rights and into public life and into government and into all levels of uh, education and employment. And it's, an, a, it's not a small achievement um, that has really had a significant effect on the lives of millions and millions of people. So I, would, I guess I'd like to point to that. Yeah. Um, what so many of us learned about when we were in school was the caste system. Mm -hmm. how, how is the caste system um, still operating in a, in a tangible way in India? Has this changed in the last 30 years? I, I, I don't know. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> good, yeah. good answer, yeah. short answer. Yeah. The, the caste system, I think anthropologists and historians will say, is not about to disappear. It's an inherent part of the Indian social system. It's something extra, uh, which seems unfamiliar to us, but is perfectly natural and normal. And my view is, is not in all circumstances pathological or even undesirable. Mm -hmm. There's, there are discrepancies and uh, examples of injustice around the question of the treatment of the 20% of the Indian population that used to be called the untouchables. There is this group. They're referred to as Dalits nowadays. And this is exactly what Philip was mentioning a moment ago. At the very moment of the formation of India and the writing of its constitution, it wrote uh, strong affirmative action elements into, into it, including quotas Affirmative action in the U.S. doesn't have quotas. It has uh, certain ways of indicating preferences, but we've gotten away from that. In India, there are very firm quotas. That is to say, so many seats in parliament, so many places in the university, so many offices in the bureaucracies, mm -hmm. and so on. And they have had the consequence that Philip described of bringing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, into um, opportunities that were denied to them. But the practice of, the oppressive practice of the upper castes uh, denying and abusing the lowest caste continues, especially in rural areas. And often it's a struggle over land and labor. Yeah. I mean, it's in the vocabulary of caste, but it's about controlling the labor of very poor people and forcing them to work on the land of landlords. Sure. Sure. And that continues to be a scene of trouble and violence and anxiety. Mm -hmm. So it's a mixed story. That's what right. we're trying to tell you. Right. It's a very right. mixed uh, picture, progressive mm -hmm. in some mm -hmm. regards and mm -hmm. unfortunately uh, unbudging mm -hmm. in others. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, that's a good start for us for this evening and, and thank you for that. And uh, Philip, we'll see you a little bit later. And Fred, thank you for coming up to get us started today. Yes. Uh, please say thank you to those guests. I'm going to hang on to Paul for a second. <laughs> And I will now invite uh, two additional people to join us, uh, Safran Hanke and Vijay Padaki. And uh, they're coming up on stage now, and so it's a pleasure to welcome both of these guests. We are going to be talking in just a moment uh, many things related to writing and culture in India, but with particular reference to a play that was put on uh, here, a staged reading at the university last night, a play that was written by uh, Vijay Padaki, and um, it was called The uh, Prophet and the Poet. So a uh, quick introduction here. Vijay Padaki is honorary president of the Academy of Theatre Arts, a program division of Bangalore Little Theatre Foundation in Bangalore, India. He's been active in the theatre for 50 years and has been a management professor for over 40. Mr. Padaki is the author of the play The Prophet and the Poet. Uh, again, I, as I mentioned, it was produced here on campus uh, last night by arrangement with the Academy of Theater Arts. Also joining us is Safran Henke. Have I said it correctly, Safran? Okay, thanks. Who was narrator in the production The Prophet and the Poet. She's a professional actor, director, and educator. Over 60 professional productions to her credit. Safran graduated from the University of Iowa with an MFA in the professional actor training program program and was the recipient of the 2005 Princess Grace Foundation Honorarium for Emerging Artists. So welcome everyone and thank you for being here. Um, I, I will ask all of you to talk about this play and about the uh, form of the play, but I would of course like to go first to you, Mr. Padaki, and ask, ask you to um, tell us about how this play came to be. It features two principal characters, one of whom I think is very familiar to many of us in the West, Mahatma Gandhi, and then the other character I think many of us know much less about, mentioned earlier by Paul, Mr. Tagore. So I wonder if you can 
tell us something about these two men and why you decided to write about them in this play? I shall try. Uh, first of all, thank you for getting the name right. It is Padakhi. Thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think it was almost accidental. Uh, we were given a compilation of the letters exchanged, letters and articles uh, exchanged between these two men, um, wondering if we could do something with it. So we looked at the material and we thought, yes, there is something worth taking a shot at. Uh, but our original idea was a sort of studio piece, a workshop production which would be intense and with a niche audience, uh, not many shows. So we gave it a try. We had a, we had a work in progress reading, a rehearsed reading uh, to an invited audience. And, and the response was overwhelming. <laughs> we, we, was, we, we suddenly realized that this is much more than just uh, an exchange of letters. There was, there was a great deal of depth and a great deal of contemporary relevance. So we worked on it a bit more. We took out many things that were going in different directions and arrived at a thematic focus for the play, which was the tremendous, genuine affection and respect that, this, that the two gentlemen had for each other in spite of great differences, very deep differences. From their first meeting till the end, they differ. But the uh, respect is very genuine. And we felt that there was something about the maturity of tra you know, relationship, the political maturity that the country has lost. And this would make a great play. Uh, so when Paul said that he'd like to do this in, in, in the University of Iowa, in fact, there are three productions in the United States with the same script. Uh, it was a bit intriguing. I wondered how an American audience would, uh, would take to this, the, the idea. But everywhere I go, I'm, I'm told the same thing. It's as relevant here today <laughs> as it is in India. Mm -hmm. And it's so nice to hear that. Yeah. Uh, and it's only recently that I got to know that there was a similar exchange between Jefferson and Adams. Oh, yes. And I'd now like to go back and read that, <laughs> read about that exchange. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Paul, tell us, um, from your point of view, what, what is um, most compelling about this series of letters? I don't know if you've read all the letters between Tagore and Gandhi that form the basis of this particular play, but you know about these two men and know something about how they felt about India's transition um, toward independence and so on. Um, can you help frame these two characters for us? I'll be happy to. Uh, the, the the letters which are exchanged and are the basis of the uh, wonderful dramatic encounter uh, which Safran and her co-actors uh, from the Theater Arts Department put on for us last night. It was just fantastic. They come at a very particular moment in the nationalist moment, nationalist movement in India. Mm -hmm. When it's clear to everybody that India is going to have some kind of independence in the very near future, it isn't quite clear what the organizing principles of the country are going to be. And you have, like Adams and Jefferson, which I had never thought of before, there is a moment when the thoughtful leaders, you know, some of the sagest minds in India, actually can talk in you know, very large-scale terms about what the country is to be, how we are to get there. The last final decades of the movement will determine its character. And they're, they're, they're passionately worried about this. And at the same time, they love each other, but disagree about how to do it. And the, the play uh, mm -hmm. works that tension between them. And we hear the actual words. The acting was very good. The, the audience who was listening to this was gripped. Right. I mean, many students who are sitting here, they were there last night. Mm -hmm. Some of the details and place names and so on were unfamiliar to them. Yeah. But you could see they were gripped by it because it's yeah. a gripping story, the yeah. making of a nation. Yeah, yeah. Were these men roughly the same age? Was they, were only, they were only eight years apart. Uh -huh. And yet, Gandhi always 
uh, affected as if he was very junior and Tagore was very senior. He, he kind of exaggerated and underlined it and, and, and there was a degree of deference and we don't think of many people that Gandhi defers to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, what would you say the positions, what were the differences in, um, in the road toward, the preferred road to independence that, that Gandhi saw and, and what Mr. Tagore would have oh. wanted? On practically everything that came up really? for discussion, there was a, there was a difference. Yeah. <laughs> Whether it was the language to be used in the International Congress, or the approach to education, or you know the grassroots movements, Tagore always took a view of the big picture. You know, he he was really the intellectual, the thinker, and he always thought consequences. Oh. Uh, Gandhi tended to be feet on the ground, here and now, <laughs> you know, let's go. Yeah. Uh, and this was a constant uh, difference between the two of them. Mm -hmm. And yet uh, the intentions were absolutely, you know, noble yeah. in both their minds, which was the, the, the nature of the oppression of the British colonization, the injustices done, the need to free the country, and the need to do that with dignity, not through a bloody revolution. Mm -hmm. and I, I, remarkable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell us what you thought of it, doing the... Well, I, I would just reinforce the idea that um, Gandhi seems to be the more temporal and Tagore the spiritual of the two men. And um, Gandhi was there doing a lot of the very practical mm -hmm. aspects of government building. Um, as Tagore was educating, working to educate the uh, next generation, which was again a big point of difference between the two of them about how to go about that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that struck me about the play was the idea that you could have disagreement and that you could be, that you could be an intellectual and that could fuel um, political evolution and revolution without name calling and without sort of attacking each other, although they did differ publicly, used all kinds of media to do that, the baseline was I respect you, but I disagree with you. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, and that's what's interesting um, from a personal level about the piece is you hear as this stuff unfolds, as the building of the country unfolds, the deep love that these two men have for each other, which we don't, see into in our public, our political leaders, or our public faces even, and that that love was espoused in those same venues a lot, always with respect. So just the idea that that could occur, when again, I feel like we've gotten really far from that. Yeah. yeah. Gandhi, Gandhi was preoccupied with the problem of violence. I mean, we know him as the apostle of nonviolence and the person who developed and theorized how to be nonviolent to, to bring around, about change. But one of the reasons he was preoccupied with it is that there was so much of it and so much potential for it in a political campaign to drive the British out. The British government periodically would really bare its teeth. It would uh, bring up troops to open fire on crowds of men, women, and children to impose some kind of order for the moment. And Gandhi was very afraid. The whole country had been disarmed for uh, 75 years. Nobody had guns in India. And uh, the British army was, uh, there were 100,000 of them, the British Indian army. So this is not a problem that Tagore had to face. Tagore was not a practical, field-based political commander in the way that uh, Gandhi was. So part of their uh, argument was about uh, Gandhi's desire to have the country filled with order. Gandhi is a pretty, in some ways, he's like Ben Franklin. You know, he's meticulous and orderly, and um, he wanted uh, to, through various methods, impose a light discipline on the, on the public. And Tagore wouldn't have this. Tagore's notion was that the kind of citizenry needed and the kind of education that needed provided should liberate the individual. Mm -hmm. And you can't be liberated or liberating and disciplining at the same time. So I, mm -hmm. s I see that as the fundamental uh, mm -hmm. struggle uh, between them. They both agreed on the ends, that was independence for India, mm -hmm. 
And to some extent, they agreed on the means that it should be peaceful, but the actual content of what was required of people in the movement, there they differed strongly. I'd like to add, um, <clears throat> when I took the journey to Iowa, uh, I was wondering what the play would look like and sound like uh, played by three American actors. Uh, American looking, American sounding. It didn't seem to make any difference. Uh, one of the first things that they said to me, you know, on, on, on a first reading of the script, uh, was I thought very insightful. Uh, in fact, it was uh, Saffron here. She said, you know, it's, it's interesting that an activist agenda is strong when it has an intellectual base. And these two gentlemen brought that combination mm -hmm. into the freedom movement so beautifully. Mm -hmm. and, and that sort of stood out. So when they read last night, it didn't seem to make any difference that they were American actors because they transcended. Mm -hmm. You see, they were not, they were not portraying Gandhi right. and Tagore. They were not performing as right. Gandhi and Tagore. Right. They were doing what the script asked them to do, which was to be themselves and to rediscover a chapter of history. Mm -hmm. And so what they were doing on stage was, was telling the audience what they got out of it themselves. Mm -hmm. And that was beautiful. I want to reinforce that, actually. That's a very good point. I was thinking about that last night. The, um, the two other actors were John Cameron and Paul Kalina, who are both faculty in the University of Iowa Theater Arts Department. And um, I liked that they, they really focused on, again, what they as American men were finding in this text. So although, and that concerned me a little bit, I was I'm like, are they physically moving like Indians? Are we, you know, are we <laughs> paying credence to that? But it really didn't matter because what came through were, was the passion in the words, the compa compassion in the words, and um, the stakes. So I, I did enjoy that and was surprised by that as well. You know, that we didn't have to layer on the culture, cultural identity and baggage of what we think of as, I didn't have to, you know, Paul didn't have to copy Ben Kingsley to make the play happen, so. At the end of the evening, it wasn't only about the Indian freedom movement. Mm -hmm. It was about the human relationship of great depth uh, and great character. And I, yeah. That was wonderful. And that, that can happen in the midst of a great deal of disagreement and change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as you, as you look at India today, these years since both men have died, what would they think about the India they would see today? Do you have any guess? Sorry, I didn't get the question. If they were here to look at the India that, that exists at this moment, what do you think both men would feel about what has come about? Well, certainly in India, it's, the play has been something of an eye-opener. Wherever we have performed, there's invariably a discussion and a Q&A at the end. And consistently, show after show after show, we've done 40 shows now, the response is the same. Thank you. But we've learned something about Tagore which we didn't know. <laughs> and we're learning something about an extremely important chapter of Indian history, which we didn't know about. So it's, it's been quite uh, educative, mm -hmm. the play. Mm -hmm. And I should say that it's one in a series of productions that we call the history of ideas. Uh, uh, it's, um, there's a long pipeline of productions here, and they're all using biography and history mm -hmm. to look at great moments in, in you know, at human thought. And this is one of the series. Mm -hmm. and, and what do you think, Paul, if, uh, if they were here today? That's a, that's a really tricky question, yeah. especially to a historian. Yeah. Uh, and are we prepared to a answer this question ourselves? What would Washington, Jefferson, right. and Adams think were they here today? Right. Uh, this is a scary thing to contemplate. <laughs> right. Um, well, my first uh, reaction was uh, that uh, Gandhi and Tagore would be revolted uh, at India in that it's so far departed from the values 
uh, that they tried to you know, build into the nation. Uh, but I think a deeper look would uh, some degree of satisfaction. I mean, uh, the question of poverty, which preoccupied them, the poverty of the rural masses was a totally preoccupying for, for both Gandhi and Nehru, and they had different ways, Gandhi and Tagore, they had different solutions. But in fact, India is addressing and has addressed the question of uh, poverty, and it's a big task to move half a billion people into the middle class, right? This is a very challenging thing. It's a world historical event to try to, try to alter the economic fate of half a billion people. Um, the country is still democratic, as I pointed out uh, before, and that's uh, very uh, reassuring. Uh, public life is in a mess, but the same might be said here. I'll just add one other thing. In the debate between Gandhi and Tagore that we heard in the play, it was very refreshing to hear a debate about national affairs in which the interests of bankers and industrialists and financiers were not at the center. <laughs> You know, we've gotten so used to this, we've been so bludgeoned by this in our contemporary life to be told what Wall Street wants or what mm -hmm. Bankers Trust or mm -hmm. Citicorp wants and so on. We're so used to navigating around big vested financial interests, mm -hmm. uh, we can't debate the future of the country. And yeah. there wasn't a breath of that in this, uh, in this uh, debate. Mm -hmm. They knew there were big economic problems, but mm -hmm. they thought that the political system could solve them. Um, Saffron, you have, as we mentioned earlier, been in lots of different productions. You've played many, many different characters. And in this particular uh, setting, you were the narrator. What, what really was your, your role? How did this operate in the course of the play? Well, that sort of evolved. I mean, this was a staged, a rehearsed reading. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a full production that we did last night. But um, where I saw myself and where I saw it going was sort of the... Um, I don't know, kind of the go-between muse, you know, because there was a lot of times when I would be narrating, Tagore would begin a letter to Gandhi and I would take it and do something to Gandhi with that, you know, yeah. Yeah. With, with the uh, words and the action. And I also think um, being the woman mm -hmm. uh, was sort of an, a specific element to have, I was the voice of a contemporary voice so I was the one happening now, I was a woman, and I was the one who could move between the two worlds as freely as I wanted to. So that was sort of the role that I, I saw the narrator serving in this. And in times that would be to bring them together, at times that would be to incite one against the other. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of the role of women, I'm, I'm interested in whether these 25 years of letters uh, exchanged between these two men uh, brought the woman question uh, into consideration at all. What happens with, uh, you know, the women in India? That's a good question. I would like, I don't <laughs> would like to know that too. So. Well, first about um, her part. The, although the... Um, <clears throat> The play is about the exchange of letters between Gandhi and Tagore. It was very deliberately constructed with, with a cast of three. And that's because we didn't want the actors to play Tagore and Gandhi. We wanted them to be contemporary young people of today who are exploring Gandhi and Tagore. And so it would help if there was a third, and it's a group of three friends who are saying, OK, let's find out more about mm -hmm. that, you know, that period of history. So <clears throat> the, the part of the narrator was written very carefully to do exactly what Safran did, which is to connect the present to the past, to connect the action here to the audience, and to connect the two men, uh, which is, to, which is the, the narrator role in, in Indian, traditional Indian drama, there's a word for this, we call that person a sutradhar. It's usually a man, uh, but she played the sutradhar role, which is making the connections. And that was exactly what she was supposed to do, and she did a great job. Mm -hmm. she did a great job. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> On this woman question, yeah. if we look beyond the play last night, uh, Rabindranath Tagore was a great poet, and he won his Nobel Prize on the basis of his poetry, mm -hmm. really as a young man, but 
As he matured, he wrote novels and hundreds of short stories, and there really is no other author of such passionate interest in the psychology of women and men, often in the domestic setting. He, he, he's very concerned and is very um, uh, capable of structuring tense and interesting stories about men and women, often in confined spaces. And uh, that's why Tagore's uh, stories and novels have been a mine out of which uh, great filmmakers have extracted uh, wonderful films, award-winning films using his, his mm. scripts or yeah. his stories as the basis of scripts. Did they have very different um, uh, living circumstances when they were both born? Were, were Gandhi and Tagore from the same sort of social setting or, or not? Did Tagore have a very different uh, family life as a young man? Uh, were they born near one another? Uh, were they quite different? Well, I should explain that uh, I'm not half the Tagore scholar that Paul is. I've done a play on Tagore yeah. and Gandhi, but I'm not the Tagore sure. expert. Sure. Uh, the, the project made us study Tagore and the history of that time and Tagore's life and so on. But I'm really not in a position to comment intelligently on Tagore's work, except one thing that stood out, that in a lot of his work, the woman is a very powerful character. It's a very strong character in his novels, in his plays, you know. There's a very special place that he gives to the woman, mm -hmm. which stands out. Any cursory reading of Tagore will tell you that, <laughs> which was ahead of its time. Yeah. Two things. From the play, anyway, they weren't talking about women. Mm -hmm. That's all I was going to say. The focus was much more about getting the Indians out from under the British, but it really is an interesting question because there was there's a big conversation in the play about the Harijans, as Gandhi called them, or this untouchable caste, and getting them representation. Um, but I thought of that, too. I was like, so how did that relate to yeah. equality <laughs> among the genders? Yeah. And then um, Vijay was saying yesterday that in fact Tagore was quite wealthy and Gandhi was middle class, right? He came from a grocer's family? Uh, the name Gandhi is an occupational surname. Oh. It means grocer or trader. So you get the surname Gandhi among Parsis, mm -hmm. among Gujaratis, mm -hmm. people from that part of the, of the country who speak Gujarati. It, it simply means grocer. So it's from a but, uh, caste that is third in the ladder, mm -hmm. the, the uh, tradesman. Gandhi did not come from a grocer's family. I think I should clarify this. <laughs> Gandhi's uh, immediate, uh, his father and his um, uncles and relatives were involved in the uh, bureaucracy in princely houses in Gujarat in western India. His father was a... Um, migrating prime minister for small princely states, meaning that he provided political uh, and economic advice to the, the local princes. Uh, there were hundreds of princes in India under the thumb of the British, but they operated with some autonomy in their own states. So uh, Gandhi was born uh, on the opposite side of the subcontinent, far in the west in Gujarat toward Pakistan, uh, whereas uh, uh, Tagore was born in Calcutta, which is far to the east in uh, Bengal. Tagore was born to fabulous wealth. Uh, he lived in a, basically a palace in the center of North Calcutta. It, it, you have to get, stand back from it to see that it's a palace because it's surrounded by so many other buildings you can't get a perspective on it. It's like standing in Venice sometimes. You mm -hmm. can't see what's happening in Venice because you're too close to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, with, he was the youngest of 14 children. Um, they had landed wealth almost beyond belief. They had commercial and industrial uh, interests. The family was uh, very sophisticated, uh, art, um, music, uh, religious reform. Uh, for generations, they had been um, social leaders in the Calcutta Hindu uh, community. Uh, so entirely different, but to point to that difference just points out the diversity in India. India is an extremely diverse yeah. place, and we yeah. could we could you know multiply uh, mm -hmm. different types uh, in urban centers all over India. Sure, sure. And does this generation of of Indian students in high school and college are are they 
fascinated by um, Tagore and Gandhi, or are they, you know, uh, you mentioned earlier Jefferson and, and Adams, and um, I, th I think that many of us, as we get a little older in this country, sort of, you know, forget about what an interesting dynamic may have occurred between those guys, or we're not aware of it. Are young people in India aware of these two people? Well, outside Bengal, the knowledge of uh, Tagore is very little. Um, <clears throat> we were talking about this at, at the performance last night, that uh, the knowledge of Gandhi is also largely on account of Ben Kingsley. Uh, but the knowledge of Tagore is uh, very, very low. So one reaction we've had to the play again and again is that people have said, we want to go back now and find out more about Tagore, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. A good thing. Um, the other, the lesser known side of Tagore is his work for and with children. It's an amazing body of work. And in fact, the, the production we've just completed in, in, in India is called Roby's Garden. Roby is the affectionate name by which Bengalis refer to Rabindranath Tagore. And we've put together Tagore's work for and with children. It's a collage of verse, short stories, prose, riddle plays, autobiographical writings, letters to his grandchildren. And it's, it's another discovery. It's another world opening up through the theater of uh, Tagore's work. Well, I think it's a real honor for us to have had the chance to have you here with us today and here this week working with uh, Saffron and her colleagues in theater and with Paul and great pleasure, uh, Vijay Padaki and Saffron Henke. Thank you so much for coming here. Pleasure to have you. And, and Paul, I know we'll talk a bit later, but thank you very much. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. 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 This is World Canvas, a production of international programs at the University of Iowa. We invite you to watch the rebroadcast of this program on UITV or listen on Iowa Public Radio or KRUI-FM. Links to the broadcast can be found at International Programs' website, international.uiowa.edu. The full World Canvas series may be seen on UITV and is available as a downloadable podcast on iTunes. Our next program will be in this room on November 11th, and the topic is Being the Other. The November program also includes the presentation of the 2011 International Impact Award given by the University of Iowa and international programs to Dr. Trudy Huskamp-Peterson. So we hope you'll join us for this uh, very special evening. And one additional quick note, we have two World Canvas Studio programs. Those are the shorter mobile versions of this program coming up at the end of October. I think they'll both be really interesting. The first one is October 27th at 5 o'clock in this room, and we'll be discussing the Caucasus as a cross Crossroads, Dagestan, Russia, and regional security. And then the next day, October 28th at noon, in uh, an upstairs level room in the University Capital Center, some people think of as the old Capitol Mall, uh, at 12 o'clock, we'll have a performance and a conversation with Anda Union, which is a Mongolian throat singing and traditional music group that will have performed at Hancher Auditorium on October 27th. So they'll be talking with us, showing us their instruments, and describing um, how this music uh, represents their culture. And um, uh, so I hope you can join us for those two shows, October 27th and 28th. So right now, we have uh, three uh, guests with us, and Catherine Myers to my left, Natalie Marsh in the middle, and Philip Lutkendorf, whom you've already met, at the end. And in this section, I hope we can talk a little bit about traditional rituals and uh, see how the digital age has affected uh, practice and popularity of uh, things that have existed for I don't know, millennia or centuries for sure. And um, so Catherine Myers, just next to me, is a professor of painting at the University of Connecticut. And many of her paintings, photographs, and digital works are based on research in the art and culture of India. So thank you for being with us. And Natalie Marsh is the director and chief curator of the Graham Gund Gallery at Kenyon College. She has a master's in painting and a doctorate in Asian art and history and visual culture. And thank you for being here, Natalie. Um, so 
let's just open this up for a little bit of a discussion about uh, ritual traditions and the way these traditions are moving into contemporary life, how they might be changing and, and um, becoming new versions of themselves. Um, who would like to start with that? Perhaps you, Natalie? <laughs> uh, I could start, sure. Um, uh, images throughout the 20th century, popular culture images, have um, over the last 15 years or so begun to show up on websites and there's a transition taking place um, in that process of new ritual practices um, uh, moving onto the web as well. So with the image, which is um, very important for Hinduism, uh, you get translations of ritual processes to new media. Mm -hmm. So, tell us what that means. Things are being translated, visual image being very important. And do you mean uh, the, the uh, image of a goddess, image of a god, exactly. a, a, a exactly. traditional figure? And now those are, those are not just seen person to person, one on one, but rather, you know, Nat through. Natalie, maybe explain what darshan is and how that could sure. translate okay, so the, to the internet? The practice in Hinduism of darshan mm -hmm. is one in which there's a visual exchange between a devotee and an image of a deity. The deity is called to be present in an image. And so Hinduism is very image-centric in this regard. So popular images um, throughout the 20th century, poster prints, um, even cinematic images, mm -hmm. um, have made their way online. And with them, uh, with this transition, we start to get darshan taking place in virtual reality. Mm -hmm. And, and um, how, how do the individual practitioners uh, feel about this? Does it feel as, as real and as appropriate as, as any other kind of... Well, I, we talked about that today, actually. <laughs> I, think, I think that uh, there's a, a wide range of responses to this kind of material. Certainly there are some practitioners who, um, who don't believe it's as valid uh, as a, a kind of ritual practice that takes place in analog reality, mm -hmm. uh, if you will. And then there are others who are really embracing it for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. So you have people who are connecting now with um, uh, temples in India uh, through this online medium who can't, can't travel there, certainly not easily, to, to visit the temple. That's mm -hmm. one reason why this practice has emerged. There, there's an explosion of cyber technology happening in India. I mean, India is one of the big leading uh, places uh, for IT in the world today. And um, the, the advent of mobile phones has made a huge difference to people. And so there's now all these apps, you know, <laughs> that people have um, uh -huh. that enable them to perform various kinds of religious practices, to go on virtual, uh, Natalie told us about this today, to go on virtual pilgrimages. Mm -hmm to check in daily at their favorite shrine to see what the deity is wearing and how, yeah. how the goddess or god is adorned, mm -hmm. um, things like that. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, none of us imagined the internet until the internet came along, or maybe Steve Jobs and, and Bill Gates did, but most of us didn't imagine what would be possible um, digitally uh, 20 years ago. And um, in your research in India, how, how have you seen this play out, Catherine? Well, I think um, one thing that people oftentimes talk about India is how India is able to layer the ancient and modern at the same time, or the ancient and ultra-modern, and so at the same time you have these amazing visual technologies. What I was talking about today was um, an, a really ancient tradition of women making beautiful abstract diagrams with rice flour in the front of their, on their thresholds every morning as a way of bringing auspiciousness into the home, and they're they're at the same time ancient. When my s students in my art classes see them, for them, they're incredibly contemporary because they're about performance art. Yes. They're about ephemerality, um, non-traditional art materials. So they fit all the categories that the most ultra-contemporary art would, but the women who are making them are making them as a devotional practice and somewhat as a social practice because all the women are out in the mornings doing this at a particular time of day at dawn. Um, and as someone who is a painter myself, when I saw these, I was just drawn to this, the, the beauty of these, this abstract form, the, the white rice flower on the pavement, and just in its formal qualities. And then, like a lot of my study of Indian art as a painter, 
I was drawn to wanting to know what they were about. And then you could just spend an entire lifetime researching one form. And I think the other thing that struck me is I always thought of Indian art as highly figurative. There's you know, 330 million deities and so much iconography. And um, so I wasn't really accustomed to the idea of abstraction, that oftentimes artists and historians will say that abstraction is really almost not a, a part of Indian art, yet these are, these are things I could see on the walls of the Museum of Modern Art, except for the people making them or making them as a devotional practice and not, one time, sometimes we say like art with a capital A, not in the way that my students might think of art and careers in art, but yet they're, they're recognized as art. So I think we talked a bit in, in, this, in the conference about different meanings and how we define what art is. And, and I think also the idea that we're talking about too, that I think in our culture, sometimes we think, well, once you take care of all those other things, then you can have time to make art. Yet we're seeing oftentimes people living in, in very humble situations that the nature of creating something, um, being creative and having beauty is a fundamental part of life and not something that you do after you pay the bills and take care of everything else. That's very interesting. I see you nodding your head down there, uh, Phil. Is this, is this something that you have? Oh, I just like the idea of art as a necessity and not an yeah. add-on. That, yeah. that appealed to me very much. Yeah. And of course, these, these images that Catherine was talking about will exist only until you know, the mailman comes yeah. uh, and walks over them or, or somebody else. Mm -hmm. So there's a very uh, ephemeral quality to this. Right. And this happens in all... In all um, you were talking about women who may live in very poor circumstances doing well, this. Well, no, it's witness because they were also, um, it, the, what I was talking about was mainly a tradition. It happens in different parts of India and has different names. I was talking about a tradition called Kolam, which happens in Tamil Nadu in South India early in the morning. It's, it's something I've, I've seen there only accidentally when I got off the train at five mm -hmm. in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, if not for that, maybe I never would have known about that. But I also lived in a very wealthy neighborhood and I saw elaborate ones as well. So it didn't seem that that yeah. class had anything yeah. to do with it. It was a particular um, uh, region that, that practiced it. Mm -hmm. and, and for the very busy householders, there are stick-on columns and there are metal <laughs> rollers where you can put the rice flour and roll it out too. So <laughs> if you don't have the time or the resources to make an elaborate one every day, mm -hmm. that, that there's other ways to do it. And that's, I think, one of the things I love so much about India. There's so many different ways. There's so many ways to reach God. There's so many, there's abstract ways and figurative ways and there a lot of different ways of getting to the same place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what are some of the other uh, traditional rituals that, that you might have talked about today in, in uh, the conference? What, what sorts of, uh, uh, you talked about pilgrimage um, and certainly this sort of daily um, thank you or, or um, expression of appreciation for whatever good might come the way of the family that given day, but, but what are the other um, sort of traditional rituals in India that, that are seen to be changing in some way, perhaps not at their core, but in the way they're expressed? Well, I would say puja uh, would be one of the forms that appears on the web now. Mm -hmm. Puja really is a ritual. It's a, a ritual process of calling the deity to be present in one of those images that I was describing. Mm -hmm. And it could be an image of any, any type. Um, so transitioning to the web makes perfect sense in that, in that way. Yeah. Um, the process itself, those, those kinds of um, stages or steps or procedures that one would undertake mm -hmm. in analog reality, uh, now you can do with a mouse uh, or your keypad or your touchpad, depending on what kind of technology you're using. Mm -hmm. So you can light a little uh, virtual incense and animated smoke will start to <laughs> appear. Um, mm -hmm. And you can use your, the mouse, um, click on uh, a lamp, and a little flame will start to flicker. And you can use the mouse to raise that lamp and, and, um, and uh, uh, encircle it before the deity, before this image of the deity, all of which is taking place, you know, virtually. Right. I suspect this is particularly handy. I, I don't know if it's more useful, more used by um, people who might be in the Indian diaspora. But if I lived in Montreal and I, and I was from India, this oh, might be a nice way to connect with all of those. But yeah. I suspect it's also used by people who also do these practices in, as you keep saying, analog reality. I've, I've <laughs> slowly figured out that that means sort of real life. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, 
and um, you know that they, they, they carry on these practices at home, but they, now they can also do them on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, as, as Catherine said earlier, you know, with India, uh, it never seems like you completely replace the past. It yeah. always seems like you just sort of add another layer on top of it, mm -hmm. but the old stuff also remains, yeah. which is, I think, one of the things that makes it such a rich and fascinating place to study mm -hmm. and to visit. Uh, because you have um, a great deal of continuity and you have this, this intense layering of, mm -hmm. of uh, cultural practices. Yeah. Oh, what about television distribution of some of these things? Do the, do the national broadcasting organizations in India uh, put these sorts of uh, major celebrations on, on television in the way that we had the Crystal Cathedral and, you know... Billy Graham crusades and so on? Well, certainly oh, wow. in the 20th century, there have been some uh, phenomenal productions that have been televised, um, some of the, the epics. Yeah, I, I mean, I've written a bit about the, uh, the serialization of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata yeah. in the late uh, 1980s and early 1990s, which was a kind of national sensation. Mm -hmm. But um, th that was at a time when there was really only one network. There was a, there was a government a uh, TV channel that uh, was all over the country and that gradually, um, uh, as more and more people got televisions, you know, it, it acquired more, more um, influence. But what's happened since then uh, in India as elsewhere has been the explosion of cable. Yeah. So that, you know, people in the average Indian city have access to 150, 200 channels of programming and uh, there are special channels that cater to religious interests just like there are here and there are mm -hmm. channels where you can go on 24 hours a day and hear religious discourse or see deities in temples and, and so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. That's a phenomenon of probably the last decade, decade and a half or so. I'd say too with the, the, um, all of the technology uh, and the emphasis on technology, computer technology in India, there are also animation schools that have popped up everywhere, yeah. and, and there are huge animation um, yeah. productions being created around some of the, the major deities of Hinduism. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and Catherine, is there any observation you would want to make before we break from this section? Um, I think the one thing that has always struck me about India is that art is everywhere. We're used to going to museums and galleries yes. to see art, and then my first impression of India is that art was on the street, it was on the walls, there were for all, and it was for all different reasons, and certainly there's fabulous art in museums and there's amazing contemporary galleries too, but the idea that I can walk down the street at dawn or walk around and, and have different kinds of imagery on walls and billboards, um, it's really made me redefine what I thought art was mm -hmm. or, and is, and uh, I think that's why I find India so incredibly visually exciting, and um, I'm drawn to keep going back and back, and then you know learning more. You know, I think what, some of my responses are purely on a formal level as a painter, but then to want to find out what's behind it all, right. and um, and it's never one thing which makes it wonderfully complicated yeah. and endless. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to talk with this about about all of this, and I might do a little searching around on the web later to see what what I can find because we'll have this, to Google uh, Ganesh. 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 Okay. All right. Great. Well, we'll do that. So thank you, uh, uh, Natalie Marsh and um, Catherine Myers and Philip Leckendorf. Thank you so much. <laughs>And so now I'd like to invite um, Paul Greeno and Frank Corum up here to join us because we're going to talk a little bit about um, folk tales, about uh, deity worship, and, and lots of interesting things here with uh, both Frank and Paul. Uh, Frank Corum is the gentleman uh, two seats down from me, is a professor of anthropology and religion at Boston University, also participating in the symposium happening this weekend. His research focuses on folklore and folk life, as well as deity worship, and some of his recent work in India has involved the study of itinerant scroll painters in West Bengal. We heard a very little bit about that earlier. We might like to talk more. And, uh, and Paul Greeno is Get back to talk with us. Um, I wonder if I could ask you to introduce us to this world of deity worship in uh, in India and, and folk tales related to deities. Some of the things you specialize in. Well, deity worship is a very ubiquitous part of daily life in, for every Hindu. I think uh, every Hindu home has a puja room, 
where you keep your deities in various forms, be it a, an old calendar or a poster or just a simple clay image unpainted or it can be something very elaborate made out of precious metals and stones. Uh, so one's daily activity in a way is really oriented around that shrine room, especially for the women of the home. And then of course, temples are everywhere and uh, deities are found in trees, on sidewalks, on tops of mountains, so on and so forth. So the landscape is very sacralized and uh, deity worship is really at the center of much of popular Hindu practice. Attention was already drawn to the visual dimension of Hindu culture, but it's important to remember that Hinduism is also an oral, and well, an oral and an aural religion. That is, it's to be spoken and to be heard. It's very performative in that regard. And so here is where you get an intersection between the visual and plastic arts and the folkloric dimension of uh, religious traditions, that is uh, the singing and the dramatic performing of religion. And, and explain to us something about how, um, how these performances happen. I, uh, mm -hmm. Coming from my, my um, sort of Western acquaintance, you know, Sunday is a special day for Christians, Friday and, and Sabbath and so on, a special day for um, Jewish people. Is, is there a day that is particularly important in terms of worship in, in uh, Hindu religion? Some of them are just done randomly, uh, spur of the moment, they're emotional, they're spontaneous, so forth. But then there are others which are punctuated. Uh, Catherine was talking about the Kolam tradition in, in Tamil Nadu, but in West Bengal you have a cognate tradition called Alpana. And Alpanas are also geometric patterns that are drawn in relation to the telling of a folk tale and the two are related to what is known as uh, the doing of a vow. Uh, so these are associated with certain days and deities to whom one makes a vow on those days. So it's a very integrated phenomenon where you have the drawing of this very elaborate ornate design on the floor, the telling of a tale or the singing of a tale, which explains why it's significant to do a vow for the deity in question on that particular day. And this is an ongoing phenomenon that happens 24-7 throughout the ritual year. That's just one example of how you can bring the visual and the oral together within the context of a popular or folk religious practice, mm -hmm. done mostly by women, by the way. It's yeah. a very household, domestically oriented thing. Mm -hmm. and, and so, Paul, help, help me understand, um, what, what are some of the things you've studied or witnessed in terms of um, deity worship or uh, consideration <laughs> of, of what a deity might uh, be able to do in one's life in, in your study of India? Well, um, Frank is an anthropologist. Um, he's close to this. I'm a little further away from the, but there are a couple, couple things I would offer. One. Uh, the historians are interested to note that deity worship can change in the course of time according to uh, changes in economy and society. One of the most interesting things I've ever read is a book by my colleague Philip Lutkendorf who's sitting there about a deity Hanuman, the monkey king of Lanka who helps the hero Rama rescue a distressed spouse. And Philip makes the point, and here he's sitting right in front of me, I have to be very careful that I get this right. <laughs> he makes the point that changes in the organization of Indian society under modern conditions, urbanization, new work schedules, new occupations, new mobility and so on, have led to a much heightened interest in the god uh, Hanuman, this figure of Hanuman, because he's very mobile, he's very active, he, he's a monkey god, he jumps around, he leaps across great distances, and there are elements of this which appeal to and correspond to the active, mobile, diasporic character of modern uh, Indian life, so that over a long period of time you can say that uh, among a range of deities, some rise and some fall in public esteem. None of them ever go out of fashion. I mean, there's always somebody worshiping one of or all of the gods of India, but 
uh, you can see that certain kinds of populations, they, their, their, their lifestyle uh, points them in the direction of uh, deities and figures that seem to have a biography that matches their own. It's a very interesting right. thing. Philip did a beautiful job on this. My own research interest, uh, there's only one occasion when I've looked at a deity. It's a West Bengal deity that Frank knows very well. Uh, her name is Shitala. Shitala means the cool lady, the cool lady. And she has, from the 12th century, been associated with a disease, smallpox. Right? Wherever Shitala was, there was smallpox. And wherever there was smallpox, there was Shitala. This was a wide, very widespread belief. She had her priests in her temples all over North and South India. Now, something interesting happened in India in 1976. Smallpox disappeared because smallpox has disappeared from the planet. So the question students always ask, if she's the goddess of smallpox and smallpox is eradicated from the world, Sheetala goes also, no, no, she's moved on. <laughs> she, has, she has other ways of impressing herself upon people besides killing them with smallpox. And, and it, this direction toward what it is and how Indians, how Hindus understand Sheetala, she didn't give diseases to people to punish them, as in the Old Testament, you know? The Hebrew God, <clears throat> you know, he'll lower the boom on you if you misbehave. For yes. sin, you got, you got uh, leprosy, something yeah. like that. It's not like that at all. The Indian understanding, the Hindu understanding, in Bengal at least, of Shitala, was that she gave people disease, and sometimes they died of these disease, to educate them. And they actually say in the text that she gives them disease as an act of grace. Mm -hmm. The goddess comes and possesses you and gives you smallpox so that you're reminded that worldly things are too preoccupying. You should concentrate on the final, the ultimate things, that mm -hmm. is the deity, the worship of the deity. So she's really just saying, y'all come back mm -hmm. and give me that, give me that love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they never really go away. They just sort of go on vacation. So as smallpox became eradicated, other diseases rose, such as AIDS, for example. So in South India, you have an AIDS amma, who is the goddess of the AIDS epidemic, and you have one for the tsunami that happened in 2004. So deities are always coming and going and, and uh, transforming themselves, so on and so forth. And uh, it, that's what makes the whole system so dynamic. It's mm -hmm. always in the process of being in flux and becoming something yeah. new and different. And are all social classes involved in, in deity worship in some way? Or is it considered by, I, I might wonder whether people who are highly educated consider themselves sort of above it. No. 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 Yes. no. You always have in universities this doubting, yes. skeptical, yeah. atheistic group here and there, you know, mm -hmm. but the, the general rule in India is everybody is religious. Everybody is observant in one way or the other. And you meet people who are, you know, captains of industries who are extraordinarily pious. You meet Air Force pilots who are extraordinarily pious. There's piety everywhere. It's a deeply, deeply religious country. Mm -hmm. well, so um, we've talked just a little bit about deity research and so on, but what about the, the folk tale study that you do? Um, uh, traditions of, of literature and, uh, and verbal tales. Well, the one of the <laughs> big problems in the study of um, Indi Indian literature is, hello? <laughs> um, we tend to make a distinction oftentimes in the West between folk and classical and popular, and these categories seem almost useless mm -hmm. in the study of mm -hmm. Indian literary production because there's more of a kind of continuum from oral to literate. And it's moving back and forth constantly. So even to say there is one uh, version of a text is completely uh, false and, and speculative at best. So what you have are a lot of variations of things. So you can find the same tale being told in Bengal and in the Punjab in, mm -hmm. in the western part of India or in Kerala in the south or in the Himalayas of the north. Uh, they might take on a new form, uh, new names, the characters might have new names, but essentially the motifs remain the same, and the moral might remain the same. 
So um, I think there's always been, in Bengal at least, uh, the area I know best, uh, there's always been a kind of interaction between the literary traditions, what we might think of as classical literature, and the performative or oral traditions, what we often think of as folk literature or popular literature. In the medieval period, for example, you had these large um, epic poems dedicated to specific deities, uh, and uh, Shitala was not one of the popular ones then, <laughs> but you had the snake goddess Monasha and, and a variety of others. And these were really built upon a variety of, of smaller narratives that were woven together uh, to create one long epic poem. And these existed in multiple incarnations. They were performative traditions done by dramatic troops. They were uh, sung in courts by singers. They were told by grandmothers to their grandchildren uh, and so on. So they existed uh, as, uh, in many different contexts and among many different classes. Um, and these stories provided the uh, narratives for a lot of um, artistic traditions, painting traditions, for example, and the work I've been doing on these scroll painters called portoas is precisely about that. They told, uh, they, they composed songs or they uh, received songs from an earlier generation. Uh, and then they painted scrolls that would uh, depict what it was they were singing. And these two worked together as an integral form of performance. But as Paul was saying, uh, with time comes change. And so repertoires change in response to dramatic things that are happening to transform history. So you get new themes cropping in and, and so on. So that these portolas who used to sing primarily mythological narratives and paint narrative scrolls are now singing about contemporary events such as the tsunami that I mentioned, uh, the events surrounding 9-11, the war in Afghanistan, uh, local intriguing events such as murders and other forms of scandal and politics and so forth. The list is endless. Yeah, so those become part of the, 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 the scroll itself? Or, or also, were you saying that it, these two that work together, it yeah. sort of becomes embedded in both? It, it just amplifies the tale from Both are changing, but now the scrolls are also becoming objectified as works of art, yeah. whereas in the past they were tools. Oh, yeah. Like a hammer is for a carpenter, the scroll sure. was for the putwa. Right? Sure. You can't hammer a nail without the, uh, the hammer, and you can't sing a Portua song without the scroll as a prop. Right. So now, with the uh, international art market moving in as a result of globalization, you have people mass-producing scrolls on new themes so that they can find patrons that will purchase these things and propagate their fame abroad. So mm -hmm. they've entered into the cash economy, let's say, whereas before it was really based on payment in kind, mm -hmm. rice and cloth and so mm -hmm. forth. And that's really something that has happened relatively recently in the last 150 years. Mm -hmm. uh, Frank showed us an image this afternoon uh, made by one of his patuas of a t-shirt in which the image on the t-shirt was uh, an interpretation of the 9-11 attack on the Twin Towers. There was the airplane, there were the towers, there were the flames and so on. I mean, this is yeah. really quite astonishing. They react, they react to the world, they respond to the world. They pick up images, they pick up stories, and there was a narrative to go with it, I assume, yes, a, sung, a sung narrative. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these traditional arts, in fact, are exquisitely responsive to what is going on around them. One of them once even said to me in Bengali, we were modern before there was modernity, if I can translate <laughs> it loosely. Because they have a story about how when they first started doing their occupation, uh, they killed a demon who was wreaking havoc in, in the local area. And, and uh, so to get the word out that the demon was dead, they started going around from village to village and, and uh, singing the song. And to show them how scary the demon was, they made a picture 
And they said, you know, we came up with this plot and we managed to get rid of this guy. And then after they told it for a while, people started getting bored and they said, can't you tell us something else? We've heard that one a million times already. <laughs> so then they said, well, what do you want to hear? And then they started saying, well, what about, you know, this or that or the other thing? And that's how they explain from their own perspective the way that they have been always modern and not traditional mm -hmm. in, in sort of, you know, the dictionary sense of those terms. So right. they've always been innovative mm -hmm. and, and incorporating uh, contemporary events into their occupation, their caste occupation. Mm -hmm. Well, as an anthropologist, have you worked essentially in one area for many, many years, observing the changes, or do you work in many parts of India? Yes, I've been uh, studied in many parts of South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, worked in those areas as well. But I've also done work in the so-called diaspora. I wrote about uh, uh, Indians in the Caribbean, and I've worked in Sri Lanka as well. But Bengal has been my primary focus mm -hmm. for the, since I did my doctoral work back in the uh, late 80s. Mm -hmm. Did you mention that he's published eight books? I did not, no. but, but tell us about the books. <laughs> well, the most recent one in 2006 was on these scroll painters. It's called A Village of Painters, and it was really written to accompany an exhibition at the Museum of Interna International Folk Art in Santa Fe. But I'm working on a larger book now, which is going to include a lot more of the songs and translation and analyses of those songs. And so it's focusing more on aesthetics and the dynamics of the tradition rather than uh, heavy on the visual vitamin yeah. side of the thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to be talking in a moment with uh, Alan Rhoda and talking a little bit about music. but. Um, I wonder if you could just um, explain how, in, in a small village, some small village somewhere in Bengal, um, uh, how, how does it happen that people gather together to hear the story, mm -hmm. to see the scroll painters? Uh, is there a community yeah, the, event that's announced and everybody just shows good up? Good question. Actually, they were originally itinerant, and they would move around during the puja season, which as uh, Philip Letkendorf mentioned earlier, just ended. Uh, and uh, they would go around during these festive occasions and seek out patrons. So they would often go to, in the rural areas, to the village headman and say, you know, could I uh, perform for you? And uh, I'll do it if you give me a place to rest my head this evening and a meal to fill my stomach and maybe some rice and, and cloth to take home with me. So then the headman would announce to all of the people that, you know, let's gather in this place at such and such a time, and uh, this guy will perform for us. So most of the songs begin with something like, listen, listen, everyone, please give me your minds. Today I'm going to sing the song of da, da, da. You yeah. fill in your favorite story. <laughs> And so they would go on and on, and they would feed off of. We talked a lot about the role of the audience in, in the making of art. And so meeting the expectations of, of the crowd is important in these traditions. So they're very acute at sensing when people are getting bored and so on. So they might throw in a digression or a joke or something like that. And, and uh, uh, build a performance on the basis of that. And so that's how they worked traditionally. They would move around from village to village during certain festive parts of the season. During the monsoon, when it was difficult to walk around the countryside, they would repair, mend the scrolls, make new ones, so on and so forth. But that whole system started breaking down in the uh, mid-19th century and, and uh, you know, a lot of things have happened since mm -hmm. then, but that, that's usually how it happened. They don't sing for themselves very much. It's, it's part of an occupation, so uh, they'll practice as they're painting, they'll practice, uh, rehearse, if you will, mm -hmm. singing the songs, but uh, they don't often sing for each other, mm -hmm. except to teach. Uh, they sing for people outside uh, as a way of making money. Yeah. Uh, do you expect to see this change quite a lot or become less important in the lives of, of, um, uh, of Indian inhabitants of small cities, larger cities, as time goes on, as everybody has mobile phones? And, and you know, I know there are many income levels we're talking about here, but um, 
you know, in this country, you always wonder, how can I get an audience to see this symphony orchestra play? Because people have many other things that keep them busy and many uh, internet and TV opportunities for entertainment. Uh, is, is any of this happening in, in India now? Would you expect to see this change? Do you want to answer that? Well, we're discussing that in the conference. This is a really interesting subject. I mean, everywhere you go in India, if you talk to older people, they all tell you that everything is declining, nothing is as fine as it was before. As far as I can tell, people have been saying this for centuries. Yeah. You know, this, is a, this, is a, this is like an old, old folks' old narrative and so on. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, some of Frank's things I've read and listening to him, if you think about what the Patuas do, they're in the software business song and image in response to contemporary affairs. It doesn't matter what the platform is. They right. can move, you know, from scrolls on, on rough paper to t-shirts to smartphones. Right. And these are family occupations. They have a kind of genius. They have, certainly they have secrets of their profession which are not obvious to us about how to hold the interest, how to dramatize events, mm -hmm. what to select. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, these are these are like uh, mountain musicians in Kentucky or something. You know, they know something, sure. and they're sure. not going to let it go. Times they are a changing, but they go right on doing it. Right. We actually began the conference when the dean of the international programs uh, played his favorite ringtone from Bollywood for us as a way to kick it off. So these things are appearing by the thousands, and they're literally. Uh, every day they're changing, so everybody is making art and music, if you will, using new media, just yeah. as, you know, the religion is on the internet, so too are the portuas now available yeah. as a ringtone, so not and, yet. And keep, <laughs> and keep in mind this idea that, uh, Philip was saying before, things are not necessarily abandoned, they're just added right. on. Right. So, right. Some connoisseurs will say, give me the old time scrolls, mm. and other people say, give me the t-shirts, and some people say, Give me the smartphone, uh, yeah. right? All, all are present at the same time. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Frank Corum and My Paul Greeno. Thank you. This is really interesting. Sure. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> and so now I'd like to invite Alan Rhoda and Catherine Myers and Philip Luckendorf back up. In this last segment, we're going to be talking about music and painting and patronage of the arts with uh, these three folks who are with me here. Uh, and Alan, yeah, you might like to sit uh, down in that section so you have room for the tablas. But um, I, will, I will introduce you, Alan Rhoda, your PhD candidate in ethnomusicology at NYU. Great to have you here with us. And I know that you study music and material culture, especially focused on musical instruments. And um, you spent a great deal of time studying tabla makers in northern India. And uh, I see that you've brought two of these instruments with you so that you can tell us something about this wonderful sounding thing. Well, um, for those of you who are at least slightly familiar with Indian music, if you've ever heard a North Indian classical music concert, you've probably heard tablas. Um, Ravi Shankar toured greatly with Alaraka and several other performers. And uh, so if you've ever heard sitar, flute, vocal music from North India, you've probably heard tablas. You might not necessarily know that. And uh, what I guess my main concern is that when we think of music uh, and we think of musicians, we almost always exclusively focus on this on stage or in studio scene of musical production and that actually the instruments themselves are uh, really important to the production of music. They contribute greatly and uh, basically if they weren't playing on quality instruments it wouldn't sound so good. Yeah. So. Um, I like to try to draw attention to some of the musical skills and the musical labor that happens off stage. Yeah. Well, perhaps you can hear it very faintly. I think, Mike, you can bring the sound up. Yeah. You provided us with a yeah. recording so the people who don't know what the tabla right. sounds like can hear a real master here. This is uh, Bikram Ghosh, who is a uh, real stellar uh, tabla player and um, has devoted his life to, to playing tabla and is a very, very fantastic artist. So I um, gave you that as a sample. Um, I myself am just a beginner 
uh, but I do have a great appreciation for it. Um, I did bring two yeah. with me um, to the stage just to kind of give you a sense. Um, when I was studying tabla making, I made my own uh, as well as to try to understand what are the the materials involved, what are the different resistances, how do they uh, sort of know how hard can I pull this before it will break, or how hard do I need to pull this in order to get the sound that I need. And you can't really get that kind of understanding until you try it yourself. And um, so what I'll do is I'll just kind of hold up to the mic here. Uh, this, is, this is the one I made, which I'm quite proud of, to be fair. <laughs> Um, and you can hear it's 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 not bad. It's it's very <laughs> passable. Uh, and then this is the one um, one of my teachers made. Ooh. <laughs> and you just hear how the sound just lingers in the air. I mean, I barely even touch it. Whereas I'm really having to kind of whack at my own to get get it going. And, you know, there's a And it's just, it's just, it's, it's sort of becomes really readily apparent then that like, it's, it's not apples and apples anymore. <laughs> Don't worry, Alan, you'll get better. <laughs> well, it's a complex, very, very complex process to make these. And you've been studying the, the families that for generations have been, That's you know, right. really hardworking tabla makers. And, and it's not just uh, one set of families. That's the other thing too. Uh, a set of tablas has two drums. One is metal, one is wood, there's metal workers, there's wood workers, there's leather workers of both goat hide and buffalo hide, and then there's this uh, sort of magical uh, black spot on the top of the drums, for those of you who have ever seen them, that uh, is called the, the siahi, that does um, great things to the sound. It helps, it gives it this ringing tone that we just heard. Uh, without that, sort of before they put that on, they're constantly playing, and it sounds a little more like a bongo or a snare, just kind of pops, pop, and then it stops. But after you put this uh, uh, material on, um, it gives it this ringing quality, and it really it allows you to tune it to a specific pitch, and it's a, it's a very integral part of the process. So you've got people who make that, You've got woodworkers, leather workers, and tabla makers, and so it's. it's and the really recipe for the siahi is top secret, right? Yeah. Well, yes, sort of. <laughs> um, it's really, it's really quite interesting. Um, I've, I've, any, I've been told by some makers that any dense material would work, theoretically, but um, exact combinations are not normally divulged. It's uh, some degree of iron and stone, depending on how and exactly what stone is. A uh, very not commonly known secret, etc. But it's mixed. What's fascinating too is so it's this finely ground, heavy material of either stone or metal that is mixed with either rice flour or wheat flour and water and made into a paste that then is applied in little tiny layers, uh, less than a millimeter thick, that are then polished with a stone until they've dried. And by polishing it with a stone, they actually make this paste dry onto a flexible surface. Hmm. So then this black, this metal wheat compound, which I think is the only time I know of, I've talked to lots of engineers and they get really excited about metal wheat compounds because <laughs> this is the kind of thing that we haven't really experienced with. You know, I'm looking Could have to, industrial applications. Oh, well, I'm, I was thinking of, you know, the 3D printers that we have today and like, could they somehow use this metal wheat compound? Because it becomes very hard, but by drying it onto a flexible surface, it gets these tiny little cracks in it that allow the entire thing to vibrate as a unit, yet not break. So it's like a tiny little jigsaw puzzle, tiny, tiny, tiny little grains all stuck individually. And it's a very laborious and artful process of applying these thin layers, polishing them, and getting the right contours so that it's you know the right thickness in the middle and the right thinness on the edges. And all these aspects uh, play an important role in bringing out that sound. Mm -hmm. And we were talking a little bit yesterday when we had a chance to meet, and, you know, as a casual observer, I think yours looks just like the other one, but you already demonstrated that the, the sound that comes out of the finely made and really, you know, really excellent tabla um, has a richness that 
you've not yet gotten to with the instrument you made. Um, as, as we come to a place now where apparently more and more musicians around the world are interested in the tabla, you said that, that these are in high demand and are now being sort of, I don't know if the word is mass produced, but, but produced in large number compared to 50 years ago. Absolutely, um, and this is kind of an exciting, an exciting time uh, for Indian music and musical instruments in the sense that there are, they are really becoming very well known internationally and, um, it's, and nationally as well, but also with India's just huge increased population, just the demand in general. So in the town where I've been working, uh, Varanasi, um, there were probably five or six tabla makers about 20 years ago. Mm. And they are now probably 75 or so. And then each of these tabla makers has, of course, assistants and sons and family members working with them. So that alone gives you kind of a sense. But um, in terms of the sort of tabla diaspora, you have, uh, you now have them for sale at sort of, um, you know, guitar center shops all over the United States. Uh, they're for sale in Brazil and in Germany. And so they've become um, sort of a standard in kind of this, it's a, a standard percussive instrument in the sort of world music boom that has happened since the 90s. So now it's, it's really become very common. And I guess what makes tabla so amenable is its versatility. Uh, these, they're used as just a little addition to an already complex percussive uh, set, or they can be used on their own. They can be used in a variety of genres. Um, that's actually sort of what led to them becoming very popular historically was that they could just be used in so many genres and in so many distinct ways. So what you find now with this sort of increased popularity is, uh, like you said, um, not exactly mass production because everything is still it's definitely made by hand, but you have an increased division of labor and you have uh, larger scale operations instead of just maybe one or two guys and maybe their kids working you might have uh, 25 people you know all working together who have then highly specified jobs um, so I mean I think I think it's an exciting time and I think uh, what you find then is um, a diversity in quality so you've heard my instrument and of course uh, uh, one made by a master um, this, this is one of the uh, challenges in an international market where uh, shipping a tabla costs about as much as making a tabla. <laughs> so uh, there's a, a very big challenge involved for people who are wanting to order from India and knowing what they're going to get because for Indian musicians, getting a tabla means spending hours with your tabla maker having at least, at least three cups of chai. <laughs> um, and you are oftentimes catching up with the stories of how your kids are doing in school. And like, it's, you know, it's not a, an unpleasant experience, but there is a lot of back and forth discussion. Well, how does it sound now? Oh, I don't know. I think it's a little sharp on the edge, or I'd like it to be a little rounder, brighter. You know, that these kinds of conversations go back and forth and it's a very highly personalized process having your instrument you know made or altered uh, by your maker um, so when you're separated by an ocean and you don't have that kind of personal connection um, it becomes challenging I what I imagine might happen is uh, you know people might start skyping their their mm. orders in um, sure. and you know, saying, well, can you play it for me before you put it in the box and send it? I want to I wanna hear it, you know? Who knows? I'm not really sure, yeah. but yeah. there's a wide range of possibilities of what could happen with that. Wow. Oh, well, thank you for telling us something about that. Maybe we'll have a chance to come back to it. And uh, I, I thought in this last segment, we'd talk again about painting and about some of the Indian painters who are sort of out there in the, the global kind of high art world and who some of those people are. And, uh, you know, if you, if you can tell us something about the art that they produce, whether it's figurative, whether it is, you know, like much other um, painting coming out these days, maybe it, it works in a contemporary genre, but could you tell us something about... Uh, Indian art at the kind of um, international level? 
Well, um, the Indian art market is really, they use the word booming, and there's an, uh, an article that I love, it's like Indian art booming and shaking, that came out because the, in the last sort of 10 to 15 years, there's been a huge increase in um, national and international interest in contemporary Indian art, and, and, and huge amounts of, of money being spent, and also t traditionally it was oftentimes um, um, Indians outside of the U.S. or non-Indians or uh, outside of the U.S. buying Indian art. Now there's a, a, a huge uh, pop amount of the population within India, mainly in more sort of upper classes, buying and being interested mm -hmm. in, in contemporary Indian art. And the painting and sculpture were traditionally the types of art that were mostly accepted, but now there's a, a wide range. There's a lot of new media work, some performance work, and um, it's it used to be, when I was first interested in Indian art about 10 years ago, you could actually kind of keep track of the scene. You know, there was a canon of artists that were in all the international shows, and I, I actually learned a, more about contemporary Indian art from the galleries in New York, the Indian art galleries in New York, than um, in India in, in the beginning. And, but now that there's, there's such excitement and, um, about contemporary Indian art, and there's so many artists now that, um, it's, it's really exciting, but it's, it's um, hugely diverse, mm -hmm. and um, there's no really one way to define it. I, I think that human nature is to put, kind of try to put work into categories yeah. to try to define. Yeah. I take a particular interest in work that's really about India, about contemporary changes, about the environment, mm -hmm. um, and about kind of contemporary issues. There's lots of work about um, communal tensions over whether it was through partition or um, different communal uprisings, um, a lot of artists respond and make work about those kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. And um, because I teach a class on contemporary Indian art at the University of, of Connecticut, I use art as a way of teaching students about India. And so I tend, in that case, to select works of art that sort of reflect India in one way or another, not that work made by Indian artists has to be about India, that would be highly restrictive um, to one's creative impulses. Mm -hmm. um, but that tends to be the work that I'm interested in as someone from outside of India, because it helps me also have a greater depth of knowledge about um, India. Mm -hmm. and, and you're a painter too, so does your own work show pieces of India? In my own work has been really um, influenced by Indian art and culture in, in, in ways that sometimes it's almost difficult to define, because my work is representational, so it's actually images um, of scenes of India, and um, but sort of a certain ways, a way of looking at a life that's much bigger and broader and more complex than the way I was sort of brought up. Certainly, gotten into the way I think about my work and myself mm -hmm. in the world. Um, but I also have had a sort of a secondary interest in Western artists influenced by India because I, my own work was so powerfully affected by India. I didn't really know what to do with all the yeah. impressions, and so I was interested in looking at how other artists had had handled the same thing, especially artists. You know, we're sort of mid-career uh, mid before I went to India for the first time, so it's not like I was a young artist and had my whole life ahead of me. I was fairly late in life when I became interested in India and, um, and, and already had an, my own work developed in a particular way. So how, mm -hmm. how was I going to let this come into my life, my work? And it ended up happening sort of more gradually over, over time than okay. any one particular can obvious I way. Put in, can I put in a plug for her paintings? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I, I saw a show uh, in Delhi last spring that uh, Catherine participated in a group show, and I was really uh, impressed tremendously by her paintings, and uh, you can see some of them on the internet if you go to katherinemyers.com. <laughs> it's katherinemyersblogspot.com as a new work, but I also have katherinemyers.com as a, a larger okay. website. Yeah. Wonderful. And yeah. beautiful um, yeah. modern uh, urban scenes yeah. from different parts of India rendered with a very unique sensibility, and mm. I think you would enjoy looking at mm -hmm. them. Uh, well, you mentioned uh, not only yourself, but other American painters, and you've been interested to see how Indian art influences some of mm -hmm. these young painters. Is there anybody you'd like to point us toward in addition to the things we can see on your... Well, there's uh, two um, Iowa artists that, uh, really? from Fairfield, Michael Peter Kane and Charlotte Kane, who I've known, who have been spent over the last 30 years really immersed in Indian art and culture, and, and they've had Fulbright grants and American Institute of Indian Studies grants, so they've been able to spend months it's, it's you know, hard when you come and go because the impressions are so strong, but when you're able to spend an extended time, and I think my, my research in that area has been more about artists who have spent an extended time in India because I think there are a lot of certain things like um, miniature painting, for instance, formal things that I think artists get really interested in in terms of the scale and the use of space and color in miniature painting. I see a lot of that and very beautifully mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. But I think the more difficult thing is when artists have a deeper understanding of the more sort of abstract 
and subtle principles of Indian philosophy and religion and, and try to express those, that's very, very difficult because there's no particular way of doing that formally. It's like they have to take it inside of themselves and then bring it out in a particular way. And so those are two artists that, whose work um, many people probably know about and seen in, in Iowa that are really amazing um, artists um, in terms of sculptors and, and painters, both formally exquisite works, but also I think really deeply, very deeply invested in their, their lifelong studies of Indian art and culture. Thank you. Uh, well, we've talked about this on and off throughout the program, but the idea of the patronage of, of the arts, who is, we know, something about who's making art. Who is buying art within the Indian society? Could, is that a question you could, could help us answer, Phil? Well, it, it's a good question, but it's a big one. And um, I think you know, art patronage goes on at all levels. Sure. But I, to me, one of the most interesting things is that there is a good deal of art patronage by very poor people, um, which is not to say that there are not lots of very mm -hmm. rich art patrons as well. But some of the forms of performance art, ritual art, uh, kind of everyday art that um, Fred Smith and I and others have studied, um, and Frank Coram as well, um, a lot of the patronage comes from pretty grassroots level. And uh, people support it, and people buy it, and um, display it, and some participate sometimes in making it, um, in a way that really does cut across uh, class uh, mm -hmm. ba boundaries. Mm -hmm. And as we were talking a little bit earlier about some of the ceremonies and festivals and so on that include music, and I didn't know if you might have any uh, thoughts on uh, the tabla and what you've seen of the tabla and the way it's, it's, uh, its use kind of permeates Indian society or helps to um, tell a story. Is there anything you'd want to say about that? Well, I could say that uh, what is what is great, I guess, to a certain extent, is its ubiquity. I mean, it is, um, it's used in the devotional music for Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs. So it uh, finds a sort of a home in all of the largest religious uh, groups um, in India. But um, it is also a very challenging instrument to play. So uh, those who sort of devote themselves to it uh, you usually do take it quite seriously, and it's not uh, very easy to pick up, but what you do find is that it, music of all of these genres has a way of bringing people together. And uh, um, we were talking about uh, folk sort of uh, art on the streets, and um, uh, Philip G was talking about the... Uh, building of the dioramas in Bengal for Durga Puja and how these are community efforts. Well, the same as a lot with the concerts. Mm. Um, they, local collections are taken up and for the kowal to uh, come and sing uh, when he comes to town, uh, you know, it's, it's a community effort to put these things on. And so it's not necessarily in the wealthy neighborhoods where you hear these concerts and where people are playing music and singing. It is actually happening everywhere and people of all different uh, classes are in fact very heavily participating in music in India as well as any of the other arts. And there's a lot of um, classical music of course that's performed just as it is here in the US in very refined venues where you dress up and you buy you know tickets for hundreds and hundreds of rupees and so on. Um, but there's one of my very favorite concerts uh, is an annual five night all night music festival <laughs> in Varanasi, the city where Alan uh, did his work, field work, um, to which some of the top performers from all over the country come, and it's completely free. Wow. And anybody can, can go, um, and the performers all donate their services, and it's because it's in honor of that, that deity, the, the monkey god, Hanuman, yeah. that Paul was talking about. Yeah. Uh, it's in celebration of his birthday every year, and they have this five-night music festival where you hear, you know, the equivalent of, you know, Ishtak Perlman and, yeah. and, and so on. And sure. people just sit up, stay up all night uh, listening to this. And, of and course, always um, with tabla accompaniment, naturally. <laughs> yes, al almost always, yeah. And uh, also, um, I was just there this past year, and, you know, there were several Muslim artists performing as well, even though it is in a very sacred Hindu temple. So it is not... Um, it is sort of both a religious and secular experience simultaneously, and everyone is welcomed to um, participate and enjoy it. And uh, 
Um, so there's definitely something to be said about the unifying aspects mm -hmm. of music. Um, and I think that is, it has a very powerful force in that regard that everyone can sort of appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a good way for us to uh, end our program tonight. I want to say thank you to all of you and thanks to everybody else who joined us earlier in the evening. And uh, as you know, this is World Canvas. I'm Joan Kerr. And this is a production of international programs here at the University of Iowa. And our partners are UITV, the UI Pentacrest Museums, KRUI, and Information Technology Services. This program will be broadcast on cable services around the state and uh, on the UITV channel, of course, and on Iowa Public Radio and KRUI. Uh, free worldwide listening is available on the Public Radio Exchange, and podcasts are available on iTunes. Please join us if you can, November 11th, 5 o'clock in this same room for our next program, Being the Other is the title of that program. And uh, once again, 5 o'clock, November 11th. Uh, we also have those two World Canvas Studio programs, October 27th and 28th, and if you're interested, go to the website, please, for more information, international.uiowa.edu. I want to say thanks to my colleagues in international programs, Caitlin McBride, Connie Shea, Christopher Clough, Amy Green, and Hung Tran, and uh, thanks to UITV for doing the recording tonight. That's it for tonight's World Canvas. Thank you for joining us. Hope to see you next time. Good night. <laughs>